Um, this is a, this is a this is an amazing song that for hundreds of, hundreds of years has given comfort to people in times of need. It's part of the shared Jewish and Christian traditions, and it's especially comforting for mourners. And um, Jeff, maybe you could just flip through the other pages of it while I'm talking about it a little. Um, one of the things that I find amazing about this psalm is the power that people attach to it. So if I'm doing a funeral, and let's say I just choose not to do Psalm 23, maybe I do Ecclesiastes instead, where there is a time for everything. You know, a time to grieve and a time to, to rejoice. And I, I read that and said, somebody will come up to me, it happens every time, and say, Rabbi, where was Psalm 23? I was waiting for it. I needed it. But I don't leave it out much anymore. <laughs> but the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Okay, you can go to, just go to the end of it. So, what is what is this psalm that we're so attached to tell us to do when we're in need of comfort, when we're going through hard times, when we're walking through the valley of the shadow, the darkness? What does it say to do? It's, it's underlined. <laughs> <laughs> Green pastures, still waters. But this is what this psalm that has been beloved by generations of people tells us to do. It tells us to go outside. And I think that when we're reading this inside of our heated chapels, that we tend to think it's a metaphor. I think that's how we teach it. I think we teach it as a metaphor, that God says, you know, come to the calm places. But I don't think that's actually what it means. I think what it actually means is go outside. Because when you go outside, you will feel all those things that you guys said in the beginning. That your ego will go away, that you will see a reflection, that you will feel connected to the people that have gone before you, that you will have this, 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 this experience of being part of something larger than yourselves. And I think the ancients who wrote these texts knew that. And what I find fascinating about this is what it doesn't tell us to do. It doesn't tell us to go talk to your priest or your rabbi. That's a good thing to do, but that's not what it says to do. It doesn't say join a support group, which is also a good thing to do. It doesn't even say to read Psalms. It says to go outside. So what is it about the outdoors that's so comforting? So here's my understanding. Physicists tell us that when the universe began, there was a singularity. One, in religious terms, we might choose to call this God. But whatever you call this oneness, so it was. One. And then something happened. <coughs> A bang of such tremendously big proportions, it became known as the Big Bang. Scientists don't know what caused the Big Bang, but suddenly the singularity, that oneness, divided <coughs> into many. From one to light, heavens, planets, water, Air, mountains, fish, planets, creepy crawly things, animals, you, me, this room. Everything began as that one singularity. In Hebrew, we say echad, one. And that divided into the many. One of the major Jewish prayers is called the Shema. The words are taken directly from the Bible. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Hero Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Although I love these words, I sing me and I sing these words with my children every single night before I tuck them into bed. Although I love this prayer, it has always puzzled me. 
until a physicist described the Big Bang to me. And then suddenly, it made complete sense. One. Everything is one. Everything began as one and so remains connected in some primal way. Suddenly, the idea of monotheism, one God, made absolute sense to me at an entirely richer level. Now, I'm not talking to you about the God people talk to and God makes things happen in their lives. I'm talking about the God of ultimate connection between all beings that has been there since the beginning of time. This God may or may not have a consciousness and may or may not interact in our lives, yet it connects us all. Now, I'm not going to go much further into theology here, simply because my intention is to talk about my first book, God in the Wilderness, although I tend to drift because the book I'm writing now is called God Envy, A Rabbi's Confession. And to summarize the book, it's about the God that you don't believe in, I don't believe in him either. So, but coming back to the eternal connection of all things, what are the consequences of such a ubiquitous connection? When we realize that we are connected to everything, we are part of everything, what does that mean? Any thoughts? 